to start with the standard stuff from the school textbooks because it's the molecular dogma. But basically what we have is the data that we are getting in that we use. And today we talk about genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. I separate the sequence and the structure because we deal with them differently. One is with the string algorithm and the other is with coordinate geometry based algorithms. When we take a number of these genomes together, it comes in with the area of metagenomics. So this is the state of what we are dealing with with data today. And the volume of data, you can look at any slides on the x-axis. You can't see anything over here, but essentially it's all exponential and going up, and it's very large. These are just human genomes. At the time I'm going to start talking about, there was just recombinant DNA technology, and there was molecular biophysics, and this is the same exponential graph. The figures are much more available over here. And somewhere over here, when there are about 10,000 sequences that were known, and about, when I finished, there were about a million. So essentially, when you're dealing with computational biology, you're dealing with individual sequences, similarly to what was being done in the lab. You were dealing with expressing and understanding a single protein. Now, one of these two areas was the skill area that was driving careers, either recombinant DNA technology or molecular biophysics. And here's the story of where I started with. This computer was a silicon graphics machine, which was on my desk. And I don't like talking about costs per se, so what we should do is talk about the number of salary years of a professor. This computer was approximately 36 professor salary years in 1994 at about 50 lakhs. It was the same computers that were used to build the graphics for Terminator, and these are what we had to analyze our kind of structures. Okay, now this is lesson number one, which is essentially, you get a kick start in your career if you're working in a topical area, and you have access to this kind of, where you have accidental future skills, and you do this. Now with my academic background, my BSc, I'm from Bangalore, was a general BSc and I couldn't think of a better start because most of the people contemporaries did honors where they specialized in one area. So you have all of them. And then I got into biotechnology which was in its nascent areas. We were only about two years after the DVD had started the masters. Today everyone is a biotechnology MSc. But in those days what we had to do was specialize in one of these science subjects. Which is the and it was so boring to study most of these. I here you have the PhD. In the PhD, I got to the School of Life Sciences. And I'm going to pause a little bit over here because the option of doing a PhD in India versus doing it outside. And what is this? There's a question that was asked as part of this uh, template, and that is my choice of institute. We don't have a choice of an institute. Maybe 1% or even smaller has a choice of institute. You apply to many places and you get in wherever you do. And when you get in, you get that kind of a thing. Now, I was a little more privileged. For instance, I have three brothers, all of whom were doing PhDs, and we are plus minus one or two years abroad. And they chose the classical field. Can we go to one of the top places? So business management at the Stern School of Management in New York, uh, aeronautical engineering after IIT at Ann Arbor, Michigan and a combination of maths, and a combination of computer science, and silicon, so that combination. So those were my three siblings in the US, and I had gone to JNU. Now here's the thing, three years into my PhD, when we met at Christmas, my PhD was far, far superior to them. I had gone to DIFR, I had that fancy machine on my computer, I was collecting data, they had just gone over their qualifiers. So I thought, look, this is great. This is a PhD in India is doing so much better than having gone abroad. And there is another reason why, because this PhD was in JNU. This is a photograph of the faculty in 1980. They had aged 10 years plus by the time I did it. Now this was a precursor to what we have with biotechnology today. Under one roof, you had very modern areas of, different areas of biology being studied. Just a short note, the school was set up but planned by MS Swaminathan, GPS Talwar, Obeid Siddiqui, and their idea was 
can we get physicists and chemists to study biological problems? So it wasn't the classical kind of stuff that was being done. So the physics and biophysics that was there were people who were studying photosynthesis and uh, optics and stuff like that. So these areas were research areas that were being followed in that school. And they were in their 20s and early 30s. And by that time I joined, they were in their 30s and early 40s. So this is another accident that was very, very useful, that the mentors that I had were about 15 years older in topical areas and would go on to lead Indian science at that time. I mean, I could pin a donkey's tail on that photograph and tell you who became vice chancellors and who became other things. But they were only 15 years older than what I was. So this is an important age according to me. If they're very young, they're your colleagues. If they are too old, they're your bosses and you get to a master-slave kind of arrangement. So this was very, very useful. And this was the second big kick start in my career. Now I'm going to stop again and go back to that question of a choice of institute, because I don't believe in India you have a choice of institute. I didn't. You apply to every place and you get to wherever you get in, as long as it's one of the better places. You have only hard choices and we're happy. And within that, <coughs> You join with 20 other people, and there are possibly 19 vacancies, and you don't often get the vacancy that you want. So you basically have to look around and see what's happening. Now, therefore, there are two questions that we need to look at. Is where you do your PhD more important than what you do? Some of the conversation that we've had is that if you're from the IISC, or you're from NCBS, and you work with one of these really, really influential scientists in India today, your career is more made than what you've done for your PhD. And is that true or not? It is true, but it's not more important than what you did for your PhD. And can you recover from that bad PhD? Meaning that you're not with an influential supervisor. So I did this area of molecular biophysics, and this was actually unique. I was the only person who could use a computer in the life sciences area. They used it as a glorified typewriter, and my PhD synopsis was typed out by myself, which was quite a rarity for them. They all had to think. As an example, one of the vice chancellors as little as 15 years ago, the secretary used to type or print out his email, give it to him, he would make markings and give it back. So that's what happens with the generation gap. So these IT skills that I had, dazzled these influential faculty who didn't know what they were. And therefore, when I gave my presentation for my PhD uh, defense, it was one of the first PhD defenses made with PowerPoint. In, and so people were amazed that we had videos and animations and things like that. Now these things matter. I know we're all laughing about it. They matter because the fact is that I could see open eyes among the people in the audience. And my examiners were really big scientists from DIFR and from other places. So I did, uh, I was actually offered a translation to teach in JNU almost immediately, which is very rare. But the vice chancellor at the time said, look, we can't do this. You go to a postdoc outside. Better do an international postdoc. And I still hadn't got a passport. And I thought, let me keep dragging this a little more. So I went to the only closest international place, which was across the campus. And then I came back to JNU, by which time, we had bioinformatics, and it was a school of information technology at JNU. So now I moved on from the PhD, and one of my mentors there was a faculty member called Alok Bhattacharya, who's now at Ashoka, and the other one was Professor Ram Ramaswamy. Now Ram Ramaswamy had built the School of Physical Sciences, he's a PhD in chemistry, but he does more maths, and he had come back, PhD in Princeton, had come back and was in JNU for about 15 years. Now again, they are only about 10 to 15 years older than me still. And they were building this. Ram was the former, I mean, the president of the Indian Academy of Sciences, etc. They are also very influential scientists. Now they were really, really very important because the first thing when you think of when you're dealing with curriculum as a teacher is what would you put in? And this is standard start of the century bioinformatics. You have sequences and you have structures. So this is what I came to the table with. Now, what they did is look at the location of JNU. On the JNU campus, we have three DBT-funded institutes, the National Institute of Immunology, ICGB, there is the National 
And so the branch chain of research across the road is the IIT. And further down, not too far, about 100 meters, is the ISI, the Statistical Institute. So what they did was they picked up statistics. And now it's not distributions and tests of significance that we as biologists know. It's this kind of stats. Probability, Bayesian statistics, linear algebra. And then Ram came in with his areas, which are non-linear dynamics and statistical mechanics. And then they brought in IT. Now, why do I put this in? When we are building a curriculum, we are often forced to look at standards, meaning that are we producing something so that the student is the same? Over here, what we did was we looked at what we could differentiate our students with and give them something different, additional skills compared to the <coughs> So when our students came in, this is what they were exposed to. And not just statistics, they were exposed to teachers from ISI. So they were exposed to the best teachers. I was still the only faculty member there, but sorry, I, I missed out. I had to learn something new. So being able to dazzle faculty from biology with PowerPoint is very different from being productive in developing skills in IT. So I had to do this. Now the first thing I did was I built a high performance computer facility. And this was something that was a really, really big learning experience. I'm not sure if my next slide tells you why, but I'll put it in later maybe. The second is I organized conferences which brought together the open source community. Now here's what I learned from the open source community software. <laughs> They had the tools of distributed software. I'm talking about 2001 to 2003. Everyone now uses social media, but essentially what we had was something called Usenet, mailing list groups, and things like that. We worked on our desktops, and there was a system called the Internet Relay Chat, which is a group chat. And these guys, whom I was learning from or working with, would be actually creating software, irrespective of where they were, across the country, across the globe, simultaneously in real time using this kind of a system. The same tools that you use for social media. So these had online communities with real time collaboration, very rapid sharing of their work, and modification and incremental improvement of products. Now this was actually how collaboration should be done according to me. You work as a team on one big problem, you collect and you can get the entire body of what has been developed, the entire knowledge base, and make small incremental improvements on it. And this was one of the largest conferences in the northern part of India. There was something called Force.in that was run at the Indian Institute of Science. So this is the first step that I did, which I call Lin Group number one. As a young scientist, and the equivalent of what you are doing, I had joined what I'm going to define as a Greenfield Department. We started an academic program with a PG diploma in bioinformatics. This PG diploma is because an MPhil as a degree was becoming a redundant degree. And we wanted to give a top-up skill to the masters so that they could go into a PhD or they could go into an industry straight away. So you had to be a master's student to join in this PG. And we attracted very, very good students. We had people from the life sciences predominantly, but we had doctors, we had engineers, we had mathematicians, we had physicists, and we keep that kind of a uh, uh, sort of grouping that we did. I also was the father of a daughter, and I don't have a true story because that's the mother of a child, but I was the father of a daughter, so I took a particular interest in being on the border studies of two particular groups. One was at the Banastali Vidya Peet, which was running an excellent MSc program for women students. I mean, the whole university is actually a women's university. And at BHU, they have the MMV College, which is also a women's college. Now, both of them coincidentally started bioinformatics. And I thought bioinformatics for women is actually a great career because that 30 to 50 uh, plateau that you have is not necessarily going to be affected so strongly with bioinformatics. And I'm very proud to know that very many of those students are doing so well. And this initial program from, from Manastari Vidya Peet was with the computer science and the life sciences biotechnology department, so they did really well. Uh, one of those students, for instance, is Lippi Tukra, who's also on this uh, team. And I built this high performance computer. Okay, I want to talk about 
this a little bit, I've added it later. Uh, I think that when I joined, that high performance computer was also a learning experience. Now this was gross worth of equipment. And I know that many of you complained about the kind of things that you have to learn and do when you come in. I think you have to just uh, understand that this is growing up. As a postdoc and as a PhD student, you're provided everything. You're like a child and a student in college. And when you take on as a PI, uh, you suddenly become like a parent or you're in charge and you have to take on this kind of responsibility. So you have to start involving and understanding the processes that work in your institution. Now, I'm talking about institutions that are largely government funded. Even then there are differences. Now the second line is when you're buying equipment, you get stalled in many places and you get irritated. Now you need to differentiate between whether that stalling is between something that is corrupt or lazy or the cause of suspicion of change. Is that 20 minutes? 10 minutes. That's a bit early. Okay. All right, fine. Okay, corrupt or lazy versus the suspicion of change. Now, see, the thing is that an auditor's job is to see that things are done correctly and they have absolutely no problem buying you an ambassador as a car even though it costs lakhs. And that's why the system and the status of power for government officers was to have that white ambassador. Because it was easy to buy it, there was a process involved. But with science, we have to keep on buying new things, like this computer. So you have to convince them and know how to convince them on to do it. It's not as though they want to stop you from doing it. But I would advise you also to avoid those that are corrupt and lazy. And by sitting on committees, you learn the process that is involved. Don't do things alone. Always sit on a committee, be a junior member, and learn how the senior ones do it. Okay, let me go through the research during this period. The most important part that I think I did was to link sequences and structures, and uh, I won't have the time to go through it, but essentially what I have is a method that can identify residues which are important for the function of the protein from its multiple alignment. And this was published in that area in about four, I just read out the journal names, BMC Bioinformatics, PLOS Computational Biology, PLOS One, Advances in Bioinformatics. Why I'm putting this up here is that sometimes in these early years you get overwhelmed and you get into thinking that what you're doing such as building infrastructure and teaching is important. If you don't get the publications out, you may lose out. And this is in high quality journals. But it's largely accidental, it's because of the uh, collaborations that I had, mostly with uh, Professor Rajendra Prasad, whom I mentioned uh, hopefully a little bit. Now let me move to the next phase. I'll go through this very quickly. So the professional journal number two is that I used that open source software and I was part of the CSIR. I provided the open source modalities, the kind of methods that we used in software development towards the drug discovery program. Now this was led by the then DG of CSIR, Sami Brahmachari. So it's not just a project that was bottom up, it was top down, and it gave me a lot of opportunity to do things. Okay, so this should have been what I was discussing earlier. I would suggest that if you're dealing with publications, you talk about keeping your publications in three areas. The first is reviews, the second is concept papers, I'll describe that a little later. And the second is regular measurements, so sorry, the third is regular measurements. Now a little bit of a di divergence, I don't think the review is that important today, although it's still important as a status to be invited to write a review. I don't see many people reading reviews to catch up with the subject. You have other ways of doing it, you find out from social media, you do searches through the literature, etc. automatically. But the measurement papers are critically important because they help get regular papers out from your group. Now what is a measurement paper? A measurement paper is let's say you've done some binding studies and you report it. You essentially just report the measurement that you do. Okay, uh, I will now talk about the open source drug discovery. They are sourced from three areas and there are two protocols that we use in bioinformatics. The first is called virtual screening and this is a typical method that we standardized. Now why do we need to standardize it? The problem is that these are ideal for short-term projects that are being done for MSc Bioinformatics and there's no sense of standards that are being used across the country 
People just do virtual screening, submit a dissertation, and the results are not publishable. There's another method, which is ligand-based, and this uses quantity, uh, it uses QSAR, qualitative structure activity relationships, and this typically is a classical machine learning method that is applied to a biological problem. Now the real problem is that this is where bioinformatics ends, and it ends with the prediction of a potential hit. So what we did with OSTD is to get the assays in place, and now what we have is that the hits that are predicted from bioinformatics can be validated through a high throughput screen, and they become what we call leads or validated hits. Okay, so you get a total cycle now. More importantly, now the bioinformaticians are predicting something which can be validated. So here we have the requirement for the assays, proteins, clones, strains, and small molecules, and these were set up at various CSIR centers. Now here's, this is just an example of why we should change the way we collaborate. This is an ideal setup. Now we define what is the target protein, and we get people to process it through. This did not work. What you have to do is work in reverse. Find out those who have proteins that have worked on those proteins for the last five years, they have a working assay, and then when you do that, get students to start designing potential inhibitors against that, then they would be interested in the collaboration, okay? You don't go to them and tell them what to do, you ask them what they've got and how you can help. And that's what worked really well for this particular program. Now this gave me a lot of options. First time I was dealing with large funding, this was in units to tens of crores, and then built infrastructure for online collaborations, grids, cloud computing. So essentially we built the back-end cloud-based work that everyone talks about today, and strong collaborations with peers, and we had very high quality papers, one of which is the highest cited ACS paper, I was telling Ajay the other day in the last decade, and it's an OSTD paper, and it's this paper. So I'm gonna spend a minute talking about why did this paper become what we would call a citation classic. Now, essentially, there are two methods. The second one, first one on the left, is from a method called APPS, Applied Poisson Boltzmann Solvent Calculation, Surface Area Calculation. The middle one is from a program called Chromax. Both of these are freely available software, but they have to be run differently, and nobody seems to want to put them together. So the simple uh, task done that resulted in this paper is that we had a script that took a library from APBS and took a library from GMMPBSA and put that together. And that was the tool that was developed. Now that was not what sold it. I put this up on GitHub in 2012 and then I sent it out for publication It was rejected. I put this up, therefore I started a collaboration group and I circulated it and then I found that people were downloading it from GitHub. So after a year after it had been downloaded and people were asking questions on my Q&A board and my mailing list, I sent it into JCIM where it was accepted for publication. And by then it had got enough traction to start being used and within a year's time JCIM had uh, decided it was a citation classic because it had already been cited about a thousand times. So this was one of the early uses of being able to use mailing lists and GitHub where the tool was freely available and made it into a more used tool than maybe a web server or something you would click on. Okay, there were some other papers. I'll, uh, I've just put them together to show you that the range of what my students were working on is different. In short, this paper from its title is Socioeconomic, Epidemiological and Geographical Features Based on GI Centigrated Mapping to Identify Malaria Hotspots. We all know malaria spread by mosquitoes. It would probably be more predominant where you have geographical locations. Okay, so I'm going to skip through the last bit, but I'll just take a second to tell you why. This is my present group, and my version of Split Group 3 was to ask them to do what they wanted to. And they did a lot of things which confused me, but one of the most important things is that we managed to end up 
with using a deep learning method to be able to predict future strains of the COVID vaccine, which I would have liked to talk about, but since I spent so much of time talking about the earlier things, we've run out of time. Now, why I put this in, and I put it in much more as a science-based product result, is that this uses very topical future skills in AI, deep learning, generative AI. The chat GPT that we all know about, the GPT is a generative tool. What we have over here is the variable autoencoder and one more of those. And I can, I can generate the sequence of Omicron by training the alpha, beta, gamma and using immune escape to be able to identify which portions of the sequence are varying so that I can use that to design next year's a vaccine against next year's strain. Okay? It's been tested on influenza and that's what we like to do. Okay. All right, I'll leave it over here. These are the takeaways, which are more or less a summary of what I do. There's something in blue over here. I talk and everyone talks about institutions and collaborators. I can't stand my colleagues in my department. So unfortunately, this is why you may land up. You may land up with a department and you may find that your colleagues are the ones who hate the most. I mean, we can't choose our brothers and sisters, but we can choose our friends. So choose your friends wisely. Okay, thank you. Ari. So just say, because you guys started this field at least in India, how did you see the status of earning for only computational world? Uh, I think uh, I'm going to actually talk about that uh, as an answer. I do have a question for it. Now see, there is a group in bioinformatics, a TBT, called the Theoretical and Computational Biology Division. Okay? And we fund bioinformatics. And all of us who do bioinformatics know about this group because this is where we get money. We also one of the only government funding groups at the moment that funds computers. If you ask for a computer, it's considered office furniture, so you don't get it. That's for the life scientists who are not bioinformaticians. But for us, it's the tools that we work with. Now, uh, the first thing most people don't know is that anyone can apply for a grant up to 80 lakhs. Anyone meaning you must have computational biology as part of your topic. But this is true with most of these technical expert committees. They can consider up to 80 lakhs and give you a grant of 80 lakhs without a formal call for proposals. Okay? Now, I just finished with a review of a call for proposals on AI and agriculture, which was about 650 applications, of which we finally whittled down to 15, which were based on the prior credit history of the PIs, which, according to me, doesn't work with AI. So I've spoken with the secretary of DBT, Rajesh, Okay, and we have, as DBT is funded, a bio, biological data center as part of our CB, which has, like a cloud computing facility, it has facilities that you can use. And we can fund what we call a hackathon, which is similar to what we do with, with open source software. But for the purposes of funding, you start off with a proof of concept of something like 2 lakhs. If that works, Last statement was more for colleges. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I'm sorry that I spent so much of time in talking. We should have had more conversation. We'll catch up.